Happy 10th Sunday of Ordinary Time. Okay, so I promise not to do that for the rest of the 34 Sunday Voices of Ordinary Time, but nonetheless, it is a blessing to be with all of you this weekend. Have you ever read a story again and again and again and again, and then you read it one more time and it means something completely different? One of the great blessings and treasures of sacred scripture is that because it is God's divine word, it's eternal. And because of the power of the Holy Spirit that works within us, particularly when we read sacred scripture, it can continue to have new meaning. As I was preparing for my homily and read our first reading this past week, I was very much so taken back by an interpretation that I had never experienced or thought of before. The relationship of Adam and Eve and the tree to the Eucharist. So, four altar boys, come on down. We have very clearly seen, and again and again in homilies, uh, In homilies before here at All Saints, we talk about the image of the man, which is, of course, Christ, this prefigurement, the first Adam and Jesus being the new Adam or the second Adam. By the way, if you don't know this, the, the name Adam actually means the man. Sometimes I call myself Adam. (laughs) But we have in the garden Adam. We also have in the garden the woman. Now we know that the woman is a symbol of the church, but in a very literal sense, the woman is Eve. But in the redemption, the woman is also Mary. Just as you have a new Adam, you have a new woman. In the garden we also have an angel. That angel is a fallen angel, a demon. It is Satan, the serpent. And of course also in the garden we have a tree. In the redemption that tree is the cross. Right tree Good fruit, bad tree, or wrong tree, bad fruit. Right tree, good fruit, wrong tree, bad fruit. Let's look at look let's look at Adam, the first man in the garden. There's a tree that he's not supposed to go to. He goes to the wrong tree. And what does he get from that tree? Bad fruit that ultimately kills him spiritually and all of humanity. And who passes that fruit to him? A woman. The fruit of the woman from the tree brings death to the world. Let's look at the redemption. Let's look at the story that we know as Christians, there is another tree. In the Garden of Eden, without a doubt, the tree had to have been beautiful, with long, outstretched branches, with beautiful leaves. One could sit under the tree and be protected and guarded from the shade. It had beautiful, luscious fruit. It was about comfort. It was about ease. It was about pleasure. And what is the most important tree in the New Testament? It's a tree of total desolation. It's a tree stripped of its branches that will ultimately have the Savior of the world nailed to it. From the tree in the book of Genesis, you receive natural fruit that brings death. From the tree 
on Mount Calvary? You receive fruit, but what fruit do you receive? Well, just as in the book of Genesis, the man receives fruit from a woman from the tree, so in the New Testament, on Mount Calvary, we receive the fruit of that tree through a woman. That woman's name is not Eve, it's Mary. And we receive the fruit of Mary at that tree. Because from that tree, we literally receive the flesh and blood of our Savior and our Lord, which is our only hope of salvation. And thus you have two trees and you have two fruits. One is of comfort, and one is of total self and gift and donation and sacrifice. If you look at the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary within herself, Mary, who encounters an angel, just as Eve encountered an angel. Eve, who says no to God's plan through an angel, and Mary, who says yes to God's plan. And both of them bring forth fruit. One of them is good to taste, and one of them is her very flesh and blood and her whole in life given to the Lord. In the book of Genesis, we see very clearly the mystery of the Eucharist given to us in our Lord's body and blood through the Blessed Virgin Mary. We also, I think in a very true sense, are brought back to that quote, and for those of you who attended our parish mission this past year, at the St. Paul campus we heard that quote from Pope Benedict XVI. The world offers you comfort, but you were not made for comfort. You were made for greatness. The world offers you comfort, but you weren't made for comfort. You were made for greatness. When we think about everything in Eden, in the Garden of Eden, it's all about comfort. The, the shade of the tree, the beauty of the tree, the beauty of the fruit, the desire for the fruit. When we go to Calvary, we see starkness, we see discomfort, we see sacrifice, we see the struggle of life. And yet we all know, we all know this so very true. That is, when we choose to embrace the struggle, when we choose to embrace sacrifice, it is in and with and through that that we truly do thrive. That we become who God is inviting us to be. You gentlemen, can I have a seat? This past week, as many of you know, I was in the city of Louisville for a mission trip. 20 people of our parish, uh, high school students, went to do a mission trip, to do inner city work through an organization called Hand in Hand. The organization was actually founded by a priest and his blood brother 20 years ago in the basement of a house. They now have outreach ministries in Belize, Nicaragua, Appalachia, and we were there this past week when they celebrated the one-year anniversary of beginning outreach in the inner city of Louisville, which is actually their international headquarters. I truly believe that our young people throughout this week were challenged in a very beautiful way to realize that they were not made for comfort. They were made for greatness. And when they chose to embrace discomfort and sacrifice, not only did they become great, but in a very true sense, they became grateful. The week was filled with a whole variety of opportunities. There are certain days when we literally were given shovels and rakes and brooms and told to just go and clean up city streets that were filthy with litter and dirt. As we did so, it was amazing to see the people who lived in this, these filthy areas literally stop us and thank us for caring for where they live. 
One of the places that we served was at a, a, woman, a woman's home named Donna. Donna, in the past three years, has had six of her immediate relatives die, all within four city blocks, several of them being brutally killed in her own presence. She is now caring for her granddaughter because her son is in prison for drug use. She wants to move into a home, and in fact, she was planning on moving into a home that her mother was living in when she died. The home has no running water and no kitchen floor, and yet she was planning on moving into it until Hand in Hand found out and said, no, we'll restore your home, then you can move into it. So we arrived one day just to kind of help with some things at the house, even just to kind of take care of some yard work outside. And they brought Donna over because Donna also, as you can imagine, is suffering from depression. To see these young children like embrace this beautiful woman and her beautiful granddaughter was powerful. That day we were scheduled not just to help Donna, but also to go and serve lunch at a soup kitchen in the inner city. And we decided to bring Donna with us. We were like, what better way to bring joy to someone than to actually have them serve with us? So Donna came to the soup kitchen. And to see Donna, who in our eyes has nothing, serving meals and bringing joy to others, brought a smile to her face beyond all imagining. One of the experiences that I had when I was at the soup kitchen, I was back in the kitchen and I was cutting up brownies for the dessert. And one of the ladies who helps organize the soup kitchen comes into the kitchen and she's like, Father, Father, you need to come out here. And I was like, I'm cutting brownies. Like, leave me alone. And she's like, no, Father, there's someone here who shouldn't be here. I was like, what? So she takes me out and she points to a young man who genuinely looks like he could be any of you. She said, Father, I don't know. I've never seen this guy before. She said, I just talked to him for a few minutes, but you need to go and sit and talk to him. She said, he just doesn't fit with this crowd. He was Caucasian. He was white like all of us. He was well-built and well-dressed. I sat down at the table and I said, what's going on? He went on to explain he's 38 years old. He's been homeless for about six or eight weeks sleeping under a city bridge. In God's divine providence, as the two of us began to talk, he ran track and cross country in high school. In fact, he went to state in both the mile and the two mile. His family lives about three hours away in Kentucky, and they have no idea that he's been living on the streets. He has applications in about four or five different restaurants hoping to get a job as a dishwasher. I asked him, I said, if you've just been homeless for like six weeks, like, how do you even know what to do? Like, if I became homeless, I wouldn't know where to go or I wouldn't know that they offer free meals. Like, how do you know? And just at that point, a man sat down at the table next to him. And his name was Leon. And he said, I met Leon on the street, and Leon has showed me the way. Leon that day, by the way, through this homeless shelter, received a phone call that he had gotten a job at Jewish Hospital in downtown Louisville. The joy on this man's face to find out that he's going to be a janitor was unbelievable. All of these individuals live lives of total discomfort. They live lives of the cross. And to see our young people, in a very true sense, come out of their comfort to dedicate a week of their lives to do nothing but to pour themselves out in service was tremendously inspiring. Hand in Hand, the organization that we worked through, was founded by two Catholics, but it's specifically 
ecumenical and non-denominational to kind of embrace all peoples. Many of its staff that work there are Catholic, but some of them are not. Every single night, our young people would gather, we'd have mass, we'd have prayer. Every single night, our young people had to ask two questions publicly among our group. How have you seen Christ in other people today? And how have you seen yourself as Christ throughout this day? The reflections each night were pretty powerful. The last night, in the context of Eucharistic adoration, the young people answered those two same questions kind of as a closing summary of the week. One of our youngest girls got up and stood in front of her peers. And she said, you know, this past week, one of the people who works for Hand in Hand came up to me and said, you know, your group is really into the Eucharist, insisting on having daily Mass and adoration. And this young girl, our parishioner, and just tremendously proud at this moment of this young lady, said, it was the first time that I realized how important the Eucharist is. That we receive Jesus, that we spend time with Jesus, to become Jesus. Adam chose the wrong tree and he got bad fruit. Jesus chose the right tree and through Mary we are given the best fruit which is the fruit of her womb, which is our Lord's body and blood that calls us to be like Mary and to be like Jesus, to come out of our comfort, to embrace discomfort, to embrace the relationships, the people, and the challenges of our life, and to realize that in them we will be great. In them we will be grateful in them, in a very true sense, and through the gift and mystery of the Eucharist, we become what we receive. Let's pray for the grace today to choose the right tree, to embrace the cross, to embrace the fruit of Mary's womb in the very flesh and blood of our Lord given to us in Holy Communion, and in doing so, become God's hands and feet and heart. Amen.